Hi, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to present some of the work in my lab. And special thanks to the organizers, particularly Charlotte and Tobias, for this invitation. So when they asked me to discuss, um, to indicate the topic that I will discuss at this meeting, I felt that auditory salience is an important aspect of our experience when we perceive sounds in everyday life, in that it explores what sounds in our sensory stimulus command our attention in an involuntary fashion. And by understanding what makes sound salient, it informs us how we can encode the complex information in everyday soundscapes by focusing on what is important, commanding, conspicuous, uh, probably ecologically or perceptually irrelevant, as it's not realistic nor practical to encode all sensory information in our surrounds. If I start with this visual analogy and I present you with this image, you can infer a lot of information from this visual scene. This is obviously a movie theater, a performance hall. The movie or performance is probably underway since the lights are off. Yet what grabs your attention is probably this one audience member who is taking a phone call or browsing her phone. And what makes this aspect of the scene salient are a combination of sensory cues, including changes in luminous and contrast, along with contextual uh, cues about what the setting is about. So now if I move to an auditory example, things are obviously a bit more different. You probably cannot discern much if I show you the time waveform. And um, even if I show you the corresponding time frequency spectrogram, it's really hard to discern if there is any commanding events that may stand out in this specific auditory scene. Now, if I play the sound, I will engage your auditory system to process this information, and the auditory system will use its sensory and attentional processes to guide interpret what the scene is um, and whether there is something salient or distracting in this scene. <laughs> So hopefully everybody heard that early on in this quintet performance, somebody's phone started ringing. The phone ring is not necessarily louder than the rest of the signals. So if I show you where the phone ring, you wouldn't necessarily, if we had relied only on dynamic range to decide whether on how to code this information, this ring would have gone completely unnoticed. Yet it is an important event. So the same would apply to other ecologically important sound, an alarm sound, a siren, et cetera. So our goal to understand is to understand what makes a sound command our attention or become salient in a dynamic scene and what processes facilitate this representation in the auditory system. So um, if this were a study of visual salience, we could have used eye movement as gaze is a good indicator of involuntary attention. But instead, for an auditory stimulus, there is really no good equivalent to this behavioral response. So for this study, we use a dichotic listening paradigm. And specifically, listeners are presented with two dynamic scenes, one in each ear. So we have here scene X and scene Y. And these can be an audio recording from a variety of sources. We included speech, nature sounds, a cafeteria. And you could listen to a sporting event basically on your left ear and an orchestral piece on your right ear. And subjects were asked to listen to this challenging environment and point at every moment in time which scene is more attention grabbing using the computer mouse on a screen. So while this paradigm is really actively engaging listeners in reporting which scene, left versus right, is attention grabbing, it allows us to probe the subject's engagement on a moment by moment basis. And I will show you later that we can validate these results with um, a different paradigm along with neurophysiological recordings where subjects are not actively engaged with these scenes. Now, the other important note to make with this paradigm is that by averaging the response to say scene X versus scene Y versus scene Z, um, we are probing whether there is an event in scene X that was deemed salient or attention grabbing regardless of what was going on in the opposite ear. So what we do is we average across many different scenes to define moments or events in the scene or in a reference scene that we call salient or attention grabbing. And now if we look at specific events in a scene that were deemed um, salient, then we can ask what changed at this moment that causes an involuntary um, pull of attention. So we performed the first analysis by comparing changes in acoustic features from before um, to the salient event and examine the range of attributes that we hypothesize would play a role in driving salience perception. So an obvious first attribute is the change in loudness as captured by temporal envelopes 
either over the whole signal or over critical bands of the signal. We also looked at a range of um, spectral and temporal attributes of the signal, either over a time slice near the event, before and after the event or across a temporal window. And so what we note is that there is a, a wide variety of features that um, seem to correlate or drive salience. So what you're looking at here is on the x-axis is the change in feature and on the y-axis is a wide variety of features that we evaluated. And you see that there is a number of features that show a statistically significant change near the event. So particularly, we know that loudness is obviously a big driver of salience perception, a wide range of spectral features, including bandwidth, spectral brightness, uh, spectral scale, are also um, drivers of salience or correlates of salience. Harmonicity or change in harmonicity, I should say, is, is um, a very um, stable marker or correlate of salience, along with a number of temporal dynamics, including both low temporal rates, which are commensurate with um, syllabic rate in speech, let's say, as well as faster temporal dynamics that um, tend to correlate with a perception of roughness in the in the sounds. And so while we see this broad range of both spectral and temporal features that drive salience, it's also important to keep in mind that these features tend to also be correlated with each other. So we have to interpret these effects as potentially codependent features rather than orthogonal dimensions of salience. It is also worth noting that since we're using natural sounds, those sounds themselves uh, reflect a great deal of constraints on their spectrotemporal structure, which would shape how these interdependencies across features um, come about. So this becomes an important point that complicates our ability to predict and model salience that I will touch on um, later in this talk. So um, <clears throat> now we know that salience is modulated by not just the absolute levels of these features, but the relative levels, and that is an important aspect. So for instance, in this analysis, we look at the overall loudness. So what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the overall loudness of a, a group of high salience events. And what we're looking is that the loudness basically changes a great deal just before the subjects indicated that there was a, an attention grabbing event. But if you compare the same or you perform the same analysis on a subset of other events that were what we would call a mid salience event. So these are events that not everybody found to be salient or the amount of salience or sort of um, attention um, grabbing was not as consistent across subjects or across um, opposing scenes, you see that the overall loudness is more or less the same. So an event that is a mid salience event is not necessarily any less louder than that from a high salience event. But really what is the difference is that the relative change is really what is different. So a sound can be equally loud in two different contexts, but may not have the same degree of salience perception depending on that context. So the next observation we also looked at is that salience is shaped by long-term acoustic changes, not just local changes. And so this is another fascinating observation is that in this analysis, we look, we look at changes over fairly long time windows. So this applies mostly to repetitive events. So for example, if you consider a phone ringing, and if we look at the overall loudness shown here in this red curve, uh, sorry, the blue curve. So we're looking at the overall loudness of a phone ring. You see that the first and the second ring have about, you know, more or less the same overall loudness. Yet when you look at how the perceptual salience compares between the first and the second, you know that it actually, there is a drop in the perception of salience, which is not surprising. When your phone starts ringing by the second ring, you are slightly less surprised and probably so by the third ring. And so when we look at the overall effect across a group of um, events, you know that the salience does drop quite dramatically over a pretty broad range. And so the acoustic change over long ranges, up to eight seconds based on our analysis, has this kind of masking effect on uh, salience. So um, this masking effect seems to sort of recover or the salience strength does recover after about these eight seconds and subjects on average are able to refresh their baseline salience to react to sounds. <clears throat> 
The another interesting observation from this behavioral data is that age does seem to play somewhat an interesting role in that it does slow down behavioral um, selling. So this analysis shows a reaction time over a pool of 325 subjects. We obviously don't have a full range over you know, sort of to, to make smaller brackets of age effects. So these are groups, uh, sort of age groupings based on a balanced uh, tiering of the data that we have. So this is a collection of the subjects that we have, some were collected in the lab and those tend to be more college age students and some were collected online. And so those, that we, we didn't really target specifically an older population, but we do see a pretty significant change in reaction time to uh, subjects that were 55 and older relative to the younger subject. However, um, <clears throat> we wanted to see whether this sort of slow reaction does affect salience judgment in this 55 and older group, and that does not seem to be the case. So we this curve that I'm showing you here is a measure of um, intersubject agreement or judgment of salience measured by this F score. So how consistent is each of these subjects is with the with the group. And what you'd notice that there is really no big difference between these older subjects and the younger subjects, except for this much younger group, which tends to be noisier for this particular analysis, though in different analyses, you don't really see a huge difference in terms of consistency of salience judgments. So really only the, the main factor here seems to be reaction time slowing down. So next, we wanted to both validate the definition of salience obtained with this paradigm, as well as explore the neural underpinnings of auditory salience in brain processes. And so we're particularly interested in exploring how does the neural activity in response to a sensory stimulus change with different salience levels. So for this next study, we presented um, subjects with these same natural scenes that I just um, mentioned earlier, but instead of a dichotic paradigm, subjects were asked to completely ignore these scenes. So concurrently, while subjects are listening to these um, nature sounds or orchestra, and they were just asked to ignore them in the background, we presented them with a tone pattern that listeners had to pay attention to and detect when a subtle modulation was introduced, as shown here with this modulated tone. So this, this task was um, fairly engaging. We sort of had to adjust the, the, the difficulty level to keep the engagement quite high from subjects. And the subjects were remi reminded throughout this experiment that the background cafeteria, nature, or car race scenes were really irrelevant to the task and should be ignored. So with this paradigm, what we first note is that the background salient events did significantly disrupt task performance. So this, um, in this setting, we are able to confirm that the uh, background salient scenes are, in fact, grabbing the subject's attention in an in involuntary fashion. And then as the subject performed this task, we collected EEG recordings to explore neural underpinnings of scene encoding as modulated by salients. So using this data, we quantified what happened to the brain response when a salient event was playing in the background compared to brain responses away from any event or near a target tone. And so because the attended auditory signal here has this inherent rhythmicity in this sort of pattern, this um, tone pattern, we can compare the phase lock-in, um, sort of the neural phase lock-in or change in phase lock-in relative to the attended rhythmic sequence at different moments throughout the, the trial. And so overall, what we see is that the phase lock-in to the periodic rhythm is pretty steady throughout the experiment if we exclude these moments where a salient event is in the background or the target is there. And so you don't see really any big changes throughout the, 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 the experiments. But then when we compare the changes in phase lock-in um, or when we look at the changes in phase lock-in near an attended, the attended rhythms, so basically near these modulated tones, we see a fairly significant increase in neural response to the attended rhythm near the modulated target. This is, um, you know, commensurate with changes that were reported previously with voluntary attention, since this is an attended um, target. And then in contrast, and what's interesting is this opposite effect. And so basically, when a background salient event occurs, even though the subjects are ignoring it, or supposedly ignoring it, we know that dramatic drop in phase lock in near these salient events. What is even more interesting is that the amount of drop in phase lock-in is modulated by the degree of salience. So the more salient the event is, the larger the amount of drop in phase lock-in. <clears throat> 
So one of the questions here is whether this drop in phase lock-in coincides with a shift in neural encoding towards the ignored stimulus. If the subjects are being distracted from paying attention to this rhythmic tone, are they really encoding this background um, sound more um, with more fidelity? And so to do this analysis, we obviously cannot um, look at phase lock-in since the background um, scenes are really dynamic auditory stimuli without some inherent prioritycity for which we can measure phase lock-in. But instead, what we did is we looked at um, sort of an envelope reconstruction model using a ridge regression. And what we see is that when a salient event occurs, we do see a statistically significant increase in our ability to decode these background scenes. So this is um, commensurate with other measures indicating that attention is shifting away from the attended rhythmic sequence towards these salient events. So this change in response to the ignored stimulus does increase encoding of the stimulus during these salient events. So this confirms that when attention is diverted away from the rhythmic notes, it is diverted towards the salient events, resulting in an improved representation of the scene envelope at that moment. So this push-pull interaction is kind of interesting because it suggests that the brain is pulling on these common resources that it has to divert or sort of dedicate to either one of these or at least shared across these two stimuli that are competing for attention. And so a natural question then comes is whether there are shared brain networks that are engaged during these two forms of interaction between voluntary and involuntary attention. And our analysis does confirm that there is definitely sort of a shared network that is being engaged during this task. So for this analysis, we wanted to compare the topography of voluntary and, involuntary and involuntary brain voxels. And so what we did is we adapted the classic technique using canonical correlation analysis for this purpose. And so here, what we're doing is we're comparing the activity, the brain activity across brain voxels during these attended targets, so voluntary attention, to the activity or the topography of brain activity during the salient background, so involuntary attention. And so what we did is we adapted this uh, canonical correlation analysis, CCA, which in fact is a form of multivariate analysis of correlation where high dimensional data are compared in order to discover interpretable associations or correlations represented as data projections. But for this analysis, what we did is we imposed sparse constraints on this procedure, which allowed us to, Im to improve interpretability, interpretability of these projections by confining the mappings to constrained vectors and therefore identifiable brain regions. So this is what the S here is sparse um, CCA. And so from this analysis, we get a matrix like this. So what this matrix is basically showing us, it's think of it as a cross correlation between the topography of um, brain activity during involuntary attention at different time lags and the topography of brain activity um, during voluntary attention at different time lags um, on the y-axis. And so what you see here is um, you see there is a significant correlation between these two brain regions that starts at about one second with involuntary attention engaging common brain circuits about half a second, sort of one second here versus 1.5, you see this off diagonal activity. So with, um, as I was saying, salient events or involuntary attention engaged in these networks at about half a second prior to activation by top-down attention. So these overlapping brain regions with significant correlation, when we look at them closely, um, appear to um, span inferior and middle frontal gyrus as well as superior parietal lobe. So finally, um, I wanted to touch on some of the complicating factors associated with the study of auditory salience and ultimately, how do we model or develop algorithms that can decide what events in a scene are deemed salient or important and maybe should be encoded with higher fidelity than other events. Now, we explored how well does our current understanding truly reflect or predict whether a sound event is considered salient given its context or not. And we looked into a number of models in the literature that were developed to explore auditory salience. So um, for this analysis, what I'm showing you here is this ROC curve which quantifies correct salience detections by this model. So correct detections on the y-axis versus false alarms on the x-axis. And um, this black curve here is basically quantifying inter-observer 
variability, which we're considering here as an upper bound into how well the, any of these models can perform. So one of the earliest model, um, and most of these models before I mentioned that, basically perform some kind of acoustic analysis uh, with um, differences in terms of level of detail and representation of these different features, and then some kind of integration across these different features. So one of the earliest models that um, we looked at is a model by Kaiser et al, which basically adapted the center surround idea from vision to an auditory salience model. So the plot here shows the ROC curve obtained by this Kaiser et al model, which basically, as I said, quantifies correct salience um, versus false alarms. And so what we see here is that the model is rather limited in its ability to predict presence of salience events in these dynamic scenes in this paradigm that I discussed in today's talk, largely because it treats the auditory spectrogram as an image and performs a vision-like analysis on the time frequency image. So mostly ignoring the temporal structure of sound as they evolve in time and, you know, and not really doing any special treatment to the spectral dimension. So other models that we explored from the literature do improve our prediction capability. So we see here two um, relative models. One of their main limitations is really a linear treatment of the acoustic dimensions. So they ignore the codependencies across the different or contributions of the different acoustic dimensions. So um, in other studies, we considered both a predictive coding model with nonlinear interactions. So basically allowing these features to introduce co-variations or co-dependencies between them. And I'm not getting into the details as to what these um, acoustic features are. There is variability and changes across these different models in the literature and even some of the models that we developed here, but really at the high level um, analysis performs some sort of um, comparison or integration across these different features, either allowing nonlinear interactions or not. So for these better models that we're seeing that give us this improvement, the nonlinear interaction is an important aspect that um, allows, the, allows us to uh, achieve better predictions of auditory salience. And so these two greenish lines are these two models, one that is based on a predictive coding, which allows a tracking over time of the dynamics of the scene, while the second one is a nonlinear interaction model that integrates nonlinearly across features. And while both these models do yield improved predictions in our ability to flag what is salient in a scene, the main takeaway um, sort of take home message from these approaches is that auditory salience is really far more nuanced than just a linear combination of acoustic attributes. And so, and there's still a fairly large gap in how well any of these models are able to perform. So in some more recent work, we explored how well we can improve predictions by considering a convolutional neural network that is able to learn the codependencies between acoustic dimensions in a dynamic um, everyday soundscape. And so this model is not very deep because we don't have a large amount of data for which we have salience judgments. However, what you note is that the, um, the ROC curve, this orange curve, using this approach does show improvements over these previous models that I um, mentioned. And really with the contribution of this um, convolutional approach is really in the way it integrates in information across these different dimensions. So there's really just, um, you know, sort of a more detailed approach or mapping of these acoustic features onto a salient space. But nonetheless, you know, we see a small improvement, but we're still, fairly far from the, this upper bound of um, being able to predict human um, judgments here. And so what the model is doing is likely learning more complex nonlinear interactions between acoustic uh, features than any of these other models, but it still remains an acoustic model. And so finally, what we were curious about, we wanted to test this hypothesis that what drives attention is far more than just the acoustic structure of the sound, but also incorporates some of the semantic interpretation of the scene itself. And so, you know, as I've been saying, um, the sound of a fork is probably far more surprising in the middle of a classroom than it would be in a restaurant. And so taking into account this context is probably an important aspect that needs to be incorporated in these models. So what we did is we extended um, these salience model by, including, and in addition to acoustic attributes, we include what we sort of map as a semantic vector, which basically reflect the output of another 
uh, neural network that is trained not on salience, but is trying to just identify the scene or the events in a in a in a scene. And so this is a large convolutional neural network that is trained on fairly large amounts of data. And what this model gives us here that complements the acoustic analysis that we perform is it basically gives us this semantic interpretation or contextual interpretation of the scene or the environment where we are. And so what we see is that we're able to achieve a far larger improvement you see here in this red curve um, in our ability to predict which events are salient and which are not. Though obviously we're still not fully, we haven't closed the gap with human perception, suggesting that there are still a number of elements of this auditory salience that remain to be explored. So um, overall, I think um, when we think about what we know about auditory salience, it is obviously a multidimensional, nonlinear, and dynamic process that salience is continuously modulating neural encoding of auditory stimuli that provide in a tight interaction between sensory representations and cognitive feedback, and that models of auditory salience do need to consider the complex interplay between low level and high level representations of auditory information. Um, obviously, this is not a, you know, a, there remains a number of open questions that need to be explored, the integration across multiple time scales, this role of familiarity, semantics, and prior knowledge. And salience is not a one-to-one -one map in context can change our interpretation of um, a sound. A number of other challenges remain, you know, the behavioral measure of salience remain indirect, so they're not really uh, giving us a direct um, measure of how we our attention is being modulated by different uh, events around us. And so that some of the questions that remain is whether we're really measuring attention versus detectability. And is there sort of um, a big difference between the two? There is really no uh, common data sets that would allow us to really validate across these models. And these models, by and large, remain fairly static and not really themselves modulated by attention. So there is a lot of um, questions that remain to be explored in this space. So uh, with that, I'm just gonna acknowledge the work obviously of um, all the current and former students in the lab and postdocs who've done um, pretty much all this work as well as some of the funding agencies. And I'll uh, thank you for your attention.